Hello, astronomy. Welcome to our second video lecture for Unit 4. So just to remind you, in the first lecture video, we went through the four inner planets. And in this video, we're going to go through the outer planets. So we're going to begin here with a, a beauty shot of, a, of an artist's rendering of one of the two Voyager probes. So the Voyager probes, very, very interesting. There were two of them, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2. Um, the Voyager probes, so in the late 70s, these two probes were launched in 1977. And the Voyager line, there were plans to have more than two. There ended up only being two. Um, NASA sort of took the end of the Mariner sequence, which we discussed the Mariner probes back in the first video, and turned them into, into the, the Voyager series. So in 1977, or in the late 70s, NASA realized, um, not just NASA, scientists realized, that there was a very sort of rare alignment of the outer planets. This only happens, I, I, I think it wouldn't happen again for like 175 years where the four outer planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune were all aligned in such a way, being on the same side of the sun to where you could send one probe to potentially visit all four planets. You could do the deal with the, the gravity assist where you send the probe say to Jupiter, um, and Jupiter's gravity catches it, you spend some time around Jupiter, you do flybys, and you use Jupiter's gravity to build up um, your speed and then slingshot yourself to Saturn. Um, but scientists realized that this was a very rare um, alignment, and so they took advantage of the fact and designed two Voyager probes to visit the outer planets. Um, if you look at the, the dates, Voyager 2 was actually launched first. Um, it was the second one that was built, which is why it's called uh, Voyager 2. Voyager 1 was launched about a month later, actually less than a month, only a couple of weeks later. Um, Voyager 1 goes to Jupiter and Saturn. Voyager 2 visits all four outer planets. Um, so the Voyager probes, <coughs> excuse me, very, very cool. Took some awesome pictures. Pictures that I want to show in this presentation are, are, are more recent pictures. But two notable things about the Voyager probes. One. We've seen this picture before. This is the famous pale blue dot picture of the Earth. This was taken in 1990 by Voyager 1. And it's an interesting story. NASA was about to, to turn off the camera to save power. And Carl Sagan, we've seen Carl Sagan before. We'll see him actually again here in a minute. Um, it was a big advocate for before you turn off the camera, turn it back toward Earth and take a picture. And he's the one that gave this picture the, the nickname, the, the pale blue dot, because this is the most distant picture of Earth, at least at the time. I'm pretty sure this still, still stands today, ever taken. And Carl Sagan, you know, we've discussed him before. Carl Sagan was a very famous um, astronomer, um, author. He wrote a, a very famous book called The Pale Blue Dot. You should read it. Um, he had a, a TV series for a while. He died in, I think, 1996. Um, but actually, I want to read to you the text that's on this, this slide here, because this is from the, the Pale Blue Dot, because um, he's, he's, you know, the book, The Pale Blue Dot, is largely about, like, the future of humanity's exploration of space, and it sort of puts the Earth in its proper perspective. So if you'll just humor me, I'm going to read this to you. He says, look again at that dot. That's here. That's home. That's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you have ever heard of, every human being who ever was, lived out their lives. The aggregate of our joy and suffering, thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines, every hunter and forger, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every mother and father, hopeful child, inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived there on a moat of dust suspended in a sunbeam. The earth is a very small stage in a vast cosmic arena. Think of the rivers of blood spilled by all those generals and emperors so that in glory and triumph, they could become the momentary masters of a fraction of a dot. Think of the endless cruelties visited by the inhabitants of one corner of this pixel on the scarcely distinguishable inhabitants of some other corner, how frequent their misunderstandings, how eager they are to kill one another, 
how fervent their hatreds. Our posturings, our imagined self-importance, the delusion that we have some privileged position in the universe are challenged by this point of pale light. Our planet is a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dust. In our obscurity, in all this vastness, there is no hint that help will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. The earth is the only known world so far to harbor life. There is nowhere else, at least in the near future, to which our species could migrate. Visit, yes. Settle, not yet. Like it or not, for the moment, the earth is where we make our stand. It has been said that astronomy is a humbling and character building experience. There is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits than this distant image of our tiny world. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known. So yeah, so that obviously was inspired by the pale blue dot picture from Voyager 1 taken in 1990. I think it's important that we, we read that because it's, it's just, it's a really cool point of view, I think. Okay, so this is another uh, schematic of the two Voyager probes. Pioneer was a, a mission that was sent to Jupiter that we'll um, briefly talk about later. So one cool thing about Voyager, um, both probes had gold-plated records. So records like the, the old style records that would go on, on a record player, um, they're plated in gold because gold doesn't rust, so it helps preserve them. And on the records are inscribed um, messages, greetings. The idea here is that the Voyager probes, they knew at the time, and now it's true, would be the furthest um, technology of humans. Obviously, our, our, you know, our radio signals are much further out, but in terms of material things, the two Voyager probes are the most distant. And the idea here is that if any alien civilization picks it up, um, the, what's, in, what's etched on the disk here are instructions. <coughs> Excuse me. This, for instance, shows you how to play a record and in the probe, there's a, a you, know, you know, you need like the needle for the record player, all that's in the probe. What's more likely though, is at some point, humanity will get that far and we'll recapture the Voyager probes and this will be sort of like a time capsule. So this just shows a timeline. The top here shows the timeline for Voyager 1. It's launched in 77. Um, Jupiter, you can see the pale blue dot. Saturn was before it. Um, in February of 98, Voyager 1 passes Pioneer 10 to become the most distant object. And later in the 2000s, um, the Voyager probes, you know, they officially enter what's called interstellar space. They cross what's called the termination shock, which we'll see what that is in just a minute. And they are now officially like they're, they're in the space between stars. So we're going to get into this slide more when we do Unit 5, which is on stars. But the heliopause and the termination shock. So um, we've said before briefly how the sun gives off what are called solar winds. They're just ionized particles that shoot out from the sun. They go faster than the speed of sound. The termination shock is this um, is the the sort of like a boundary across the solar system where the solar winds start going slower than the speed of sound, and the Voyager probes can detect the solar winds. So the termination shock is when you cross that, that boundary where the solar winds are going slower than the speed of sound. The heliopause is a region where, so you have the solar winds. Outside that, just in, in interstellar space, you have just what's called the interstellar medium. It's stuff left over from other stars going supernova. It's just the medium of space. And when those two meet each other, you know, there's a pressure of the solar winds, there's a pressure of the interstellar medium, when they meet each other and the two pressures like come to equilibrium, that's called the heliopause. And that's like the, the definition of leaving the solar system. And the Voyager probes have and, you know, they crossed that years ago. And they're still going, right? Um, you know, we're talking about technology that's 40 plus years old. Obviously, the probes themselves, there are instruments that no longer work, but we can still communicate with them. And they're still detecting, of course, there's not much really to detect where they are now. But, but they're, still, they're still active missions. Their batteries are still um, operational. Okay, so at this point, let's go through the outer planet. So like I said in the first video, I'm not gonna do like an exhaustive survey of each planet. The readings are what, are what 
the readings are meant to go through the planets in more detail. We're just going to hit the highlights, talk about some details. There's some very short videos that I want to show um, and show some pretty things. So Jupiter. So Jupiter um, is the largest planet. Obviously, it's the, um, the Roman name for Zeus. When you look at Jupiter, you're seeing clouds. When you see a you know, Jupiter in motion, the, the clouds are, are rotating around Jupiter. Um, people think Jupiter has a solid core, although no one's ever like been to the core. And when I was in high school, there was actually a cool event where a comet struck Jupiter. We knew that it was going to happen. And it was cool because you could you could see it happen and you could see like the, the clouds wherever it hit were like disturbed for a short period of time. But then they went back to normal and the comet didn't like come out the other end. The comet is now just part of Jupiter. Um, it probably got crushed by Jupiter's intense um, pressures because all, you know, all the atmosphere creates a lot, a lot of pressure. Here you can see the great red spot, which is a hurricane. Um, Galileo described it, so it's been there for at least 400 or so years. But all these, like these are tiny little storms too. Um, the great red spot is larger than Earth. Earth could fit inside it. One cool thing about Jupiter, Jupiter has an incredibly intense magnetic field. Um, the, mag the magnetosphere around Jupiter, it's just, like th this picture is showing the, the solar winds being deflected by Earth's magnetic field. Um, it's super, super strong, such, such that electronics that we send to Jupiter would get fried by the, um, by the interactions. Um, you don't really orbit Jupiter. You do like flybys of Jupiter, because if you orbit Jupiter, you're gonna, you know, the, the, the electronics are gonna be fried. Um, there's a mission being planned now called the, called the Europa Clipper. We'll talk about it actually here just a minute to visit Europa and you can't orbit Europa. Well, you could, that's a moon of Jupiter. If you did, you'd be so close to Jupiter that your electronics would obviously, you know, would be killed. So you had, you do like flyby, it's like a fast, the old, the old clipper ships of days gone by where you would sail across the Atlantic super, super fast. Um, the Europa Clipper will do quick flybys of Europa, then get out to get away from the magnetic field and then come back in, you get the idea. So Jupiter has a bunch of moons. We've already discussed the four biggest ones <coughs> are called the Galilean moons because they were discovered by Galileo. Um, th this picture, this is taken with a backyard telescope. Um, you know, with, with a cheap telescope, you can see the four moons of Jupiter very, very easily. Um, We'll come back to them in a minute. This picture, there's a current mission at Jupiter called Juno, and Juno has sent back incredible pictures of Jupiter. It looks almost like an oil painting. They're just really, really gorgeous. So just some size comparisons. Here's the sun, here's Jupiter, here's Earth, here's the moon. This shows the number of Jupiters, is that 10 that go across the surface of the sun? And here you can see the number of Earths that go across Jupiter and how Earth is smaller than the Great Red Spot. And this just shows in comparison um, the moon. Earth's moon is much, much bigger compared to Earth than say Jupiter's moons are compared to it. So let's talk about a couple of the moons. So you have Ganymede, Callisto, Io, and Europa. Those are the four Galilean moons. If you look at them, they're rocky. You could land on them. Ganymede's the biggest moon that we've discovered. Ganymede's bigger than Pluto, it's bigger than Mercury. It would be a planet all by itself if it orbited the sun um, with, not, with nothing else around it. So one of the most interesting moons that there is, you know, we could spend forever discussing Jupiter, but the moons of Jupiter are super duper interesting. This is a picture of Europa. Europa is this one right here. Um, Europa's covered in ice. Obviously it's cold, so it's not surprising. You're way further from the sun. Um, but like the ice has these cracks in it. And if, if you look at Europa, like you don't see any craters. I mean, obviously things can hit Europa. So if you don't see craters, you know, there's no atmosphere to burn stuff up. It means that the surface of Europa gets like re reformed. It gets remolded because you don't see craters, right? Which tells you that it's sort of like it melts and refreezes, right? So Europa um, in the 2000s, it was discovered that Europa has a subterranean ocean that's superheated. And you can see in this picture, you see these plumes, it's almost like Old Faithful erupting. 
but in this case, it's a plume, like a, a geyser erupting into space. And Europa, like I say, has this undersea ocean that it's, it's hot. So why is it hot? Um, there's no like molten core or iron core like Earth has. Um, it's hot because you get what's called gravitational heating. So Jupiter's gravity is so strong. It's sort of like tides, how the moon causes tides on the Earth. But as Europa goes around Jupiter, the force of gravity changes depending upon where it is. And it's like pulling on the water, pulling on the ocean, which is creating friction. And so the, the subterranean ocean is being heated due to Jupiter's gravity. And you can see like these, you can see geysers, you can see these like linear cracks, looks almost like a stripe. Um, if you'll humor me, I want to show this very short. Europa is the most likely place to find life in our solar system today because we think there's a liquid water ocean beneath its surface. Now we know that on Earth, everywhere that there's water, we find life. So could Europa have the ingredients to support life? We might be actually looking at a body that is presently alive, presently active, and presently undergoing its geology. There is too much evidence right now lying around on the surface, the red stuff, that suggests that something's going on there. Is that an environment that is habitable for any sort of life form? By golly, we really have got to go back and figure that out. We have designed the Europa mission to take a spacecraft and a set of instruments all the way from planet Earth to Jupiter. Previous mission concepts were for a spacecraft that would orbit Europa, but Europa is bathed in radiation from Jupiter. Any mission that goes in the vicinity of Europa is cooked pretty quickly. Instead, we're looking at a mission that will orbit Jupiter, make close flybys of Europa, and then zip out of the high radiation region. Kind of like when I was a kid, we had the sprinklers, and we didn't want to be too close to the sprinkler head, so we would, we would run in and get a little water and then run back out again. This allows us to have a mission that's many years long and to collect and transmit lots and lots of data. As Europa orbits Jupiter, it flexes, and we could measure the gravitational change of Europa by encountering Europa at different points in its orbit. On a typical flyby, we would turn on our remote sensing instruments, we would image the surface, we would interrogate the surface with spectroscopy, and we would do the same thing on the way out. And we would essentially rinse and repeat and do this many, many times until we understand Europa globally. Images from the Hubble Space Telescope tells us that Europa might be erupting plumes of water high into space. If that's true, then we could fly through those plumes with a spacecraft and literally taste it to understand the composition of Europa's interior. If it does have the ability to harbor life, how does that work exactly? We'll have enough instrumentation to really pinpoint exactly how the mechanisms would work for replenishing the nutrients in a subsurface ocean. Europa is so important because we want to understand, are we alone in the cosmos? If there's life in Europa, it almost certainly was completely independent from the origin of life on Earth. That would mean the origin of life must be pretty easy throughout the galaxy and beyond. Okay, so you get the gist. Europa is a very, very interesting place in terms of looking for life on other planets, in this case, on a moon, um, because it does, and there's water, there's a, a heat source, it could um, potentially house you know, microscopic life. So this is Io, Io is another moon of Jupiter. Um, I picked this picture because Io has erupting volcanoes, which is kind of cool. Um, and here you can see, again, the surface is not very cratered, which tells you it gets reformed. In this case, it might be reformed due to lava erupting and then spreading out and hardening. Hardening. Okay, so let's move on. So is Saturn. Saturn's Saturn's the poster child of the outer planets. It's by far the most photogenic planet because of its rings. Um, one cool thing about Saturn, you can see this. Saturn has a hexagon at its north pole. It's a hexagon that spins. I think we'll see more about that pro probably later. 
Um, it's almost like like the the eye wall of a hurricane. You can look down into some of the interior of Saturn. I'm not that deep. You can look into it like it's looking into the eye of a hurricane. Um, this is a really cool picture. Saturn, it's backlit. The sun's obviously you know behind you in the picture. In this picture, these were both taken from the Cassini mission, which we'll see in a minute. This picture is another pale blue dot. This one's more recent. Um, this one's cl closer than Voyager one was, but um. Yeah, there's the Earth. So Saturn, gosh, there's there's so much to say. Um, first off, the rings. So Jupiter, Jupiter does have a couple of very 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 thin rings. Um, Saturn obviously has the the most photogenic, the most beautiful ring system of, of any planet in our solar system. Um, the rings were probably uh, a moon that could not get its act together to solidify. Um, probably the gravity of Saturn might have perturbed it. Kind of like we discussed with the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter, which actually we'll see that more in, in the third video. So Cassini um, was a mission that was, you know, I, I love the Voyager probes. The Voyager probes are, are my jam. But Cassini was just, just a, I mean, an incredibly cool mission. I mean, you can read this yourself, but you can see Cassini it was launched in the 90s and it, the mission itself lasted i think 20 years um one cool thing this this piece right here is called the huygens probe this is a, a separate probe that can detach and this thing actually landed on titan which is saturn's largest moon um the cameras on cassini were just incredible so i mean you can read the dates launched in 97 the mission ended in 2017 Actually, I was teaching astronomy when it happened, and we, we followed this um, when it happened. They they ended the mission by like crashing it into Saturn. Like they flew it into, of course, you can't crash on Saturn. Saturn's just atmosphere. Um, Saturn, like Jupiter, is mainly hydrogen and helium. Probably should have said that back with, with Jupiter. But they flew it <clears throat> into Saturn, and they collected data until the probe got crushed by Saturn's pressure. And now it's just part of Saturn. Um, of course, it's been crushed. And one reason why they did that was they didn't that you could you could just leave it as just space junk orbiting Saturn, but they didn't want it to risk crashing into a moon of Saturn and like polluting it. So they decided just to fly it straight into Saturn and it would have a, a glorious death. So the um, the Huygens probe, this is an artist's rendering. So Saturn has a moon called Titan. Um, this is actually a picture of the surface of Titan, which this is incredible. We've, we've landed, this wasn't a rover, this was just like, just like a lander, just, I just had cameras on it. Um, we landed a, you know, technology on a moon, um, besides our moon, on Titan. And Titan is really, really cool. Um, you know, people talk about Europa as potentially being a site where life could exist. They say the same thing about Titan. Titan, and I want to show this quick zoom in in a minute, but actually I want to skip it. So Titan has lakes on it, and they're lakes made of methane. So methane, think of like rubbing alcohol, although methane is a gas at room temperature. Um, here, obviously, it's, it's very, very cold. And, you know, in a lake of methane would be like going into a lake of rubbing alcohol. You would, it, it would be very, very cold. But if you look at these pictures, this is a zoom in of Titan. So this area here that's that's blown up here over different times, you can see like the profile of the of this little like uh, inlet or whatever you want to call it changes, which tells you there's like tides or there's weather or there's currents or waves or something to where the the sea line or this you know, the the lake line, whatever you want to call it, um, changes. And there are definitely bacteria on Earth that love methane, like it is totally possible that you could have microscopic life on on titan um this video here this is a like a composite video showing the huygens probe landing on on titan we embark on a journey that will bring us a billion times closer to titan's surface titan is saturn's largest moon right in front of saturn's disk in this image taken by the cassini spacecraft Saturn's atmosphere shows a banded structure and a number of storms. We view the edge of Saturn's gigantic ring system. The rings cast major shadows onto Saturn's southern hemisphere. 
Titan is surrounded by a partially transparent brown haze. Features on Titan's surface appear. The dark regions along Titan's equator are mostly dune fields. The brighter regions are highlands a few hundred meters high. Images taken from the Huygens probe show Titan's surface in more detail. The probe had spectrometers that measured small variations in the color of Titan's surface that are exaggerated here. Most of Titan's surface is brown. North of the landing site, a pair of parallel dark dunes stretch east-west along the image. Right here. A large highland of triangular shape lies to the northwest. More and more dark canyons appear in this area a complicated network of channels where rivers of methane flowed at some time in the past. To the east of the landing site is a system of bright ridges standing out above the dark, dry lake bed. The ridges have intricate structures that tell stories about their past. The Huygens probe descended toward one of these ridges. As we approach the surface further, we can see this ridge in finer detail. Some regions were imaged with high resolution just before Huygens landed on Titan, especially the area to the west of the landing site. Most of Titan's surface is covered by dark organics that are produced in the atmosphere and slowly settle down. The bright spots may be exposed patches of water ice. The white dot in the center of the image is the landed Huygens probe. While the probe rotated during the descent, its orientation after landing had the camera looking to the south. The camera saw a field of pebbles that were carried around by a river of methane in the past. Some pebbles are larger than a human hand. The descent imager spectral radiometer is the dark green instrument at the south side of the Huygens probe. Its lamp illuminated the surface, allowing spectral analysis. The lamp's spotlight stands out brightly since days on Titan are even darker than cloudy days on Earth. Little sunlight reaches Titan's surface due to its thick haze and large distance from the sun. The right side shows the green Dizzer instrument. With the gold-colored lamp and the three camera windows to its right, the cameras that provided the first close-up view of Titan's shrouded surface. Okay, so you have rivers of methane, lakes of methane, that's just, that's just crazy. Okay, so we, we discussed this. I mean, you can see like how the water or not the water, the methane is like flowing in channels. It's just so cool. So the other moon, on, on the other moon that I want to talk about, there's more than just two moons of Saturn. It's called Enceladus. So Enceladus is this tiny little moon. Um, you would never even notice that it was there. It'd be very hard to see if it weren't for the fact that its surface is frozen and it's incredibly reflective. It reflects a lot of the sun's light. And again, um, if you look at it, I don't see a lot of craters. I see a couple actually, but that tells me that the surface gets reformed. So Enceladus, this is a thermal picture of Enceladus. Um, the Cassini mission noticed that the, the bottom of Enceladus was really, really hot and it was erupting something into space. And kind of like um, Europa, but actually more so with Enceladus, it had these geysers that are erupting. And again, you almost see like this, this, go back, this striped appearance on the surface, um, which again is another indication that there's some kind of subterranean hydrothermal sea that is, that is super hot. All right. Enceladus, I want to show this last video really quickly. Cassini actually flew through the plume, which is super cool. The instrument acts like a human nose, analyzing the smell, so to speak, or the composition of the gases in the environment. There was a significant amount of molecular hydrogen The existence of molecular hydrogen, at least within the Earth's ocean system, is a like a food source. It's candy for microbes. They eat the hydrogen, they turn it into methane. And with our findings, we were able 
to not only find out that there was H2 in the system, but to examine the chemistry that's associated with that process of taking hydrogen and turning it into methane. Here on Earth, the hydrothermal systems known as white smokers have water-rock interactions that lead to the release of molecular hydrogen in a similar fashion to apparently what's going on in Enceladus. This is just the final step that shows that there's molecular hydrogen being produced by these same hydrothermal processes, and that molecular hydrogen has the chemical energy to support microbial systems in the interior ocean. It's not demonstration of finding life, but it shows the potential for the existence of life in this interior ocean. Yeah, so Enceladus is another sort of target for a future mission. Um, to see if it could, but well, it can support life, to see if there could ever be, or there could be the science of life on Enceladus. Okay, so we spent much time with Jupiter and Saturn. Let's go through Uranus and Neptune kind of kind of quickly. So, you know, to the ancient Greeks, the last, you know, they knew the planets through Saturn. All right, Uranus and Neptune were both discovered. Uranus was discovered in 1780s, I think. It was toward, toward the end of, of the 18th century. Neptune obviously came, came later. Um, Uranus was discovered by William Herschel, who was a British astronomer. So, okay, where do we where do we begin? So let's begin with the name Uranus, right? So it's not Uranus, it's Uranus. So when the planet was first named, um, Herschel named it after King George, who was king at the time. It was just called like the Georgian planet. I guess today you might call it Georgia or Georgius. And that was later changed um, to Uranus. So first off, Uranus is, is a, a, a Greek name, not a Roman name. Um, so Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Jupiter is, is Zeus. Saturn is Chrono. Saturn is the father of Zeus. And in, in, the, in the mythological sequence, Uranus was the father of, of Saturn. So it made sense to go like son, father, grandfather. Of course, once you got to Neptune, that's Poseidon, that's the sequence breaks down. But that's why they picked the name um, Uranus so that it would be mythological, although it's Greek, not Roman, in terms of the name. And it's the father of Saturn. Um, you can see Uranus has, has a very thin ring system. This picture, I think this picture is taken from one of the Voyager probes. Um, the bluish colors due to methane, both Uranus and Neptune are, are mostly uh, methane in their atmospheres. Now you can see Uranus rotates on its side. Um, there's a lot of debate as to why. Um, maybe something, uh, an asteroid or something smacked it. Maybe it got, you know, smacked on its Uranus. <laughs> anyway, um, but no one knows for sure, but it, it rotates almost like an 80 or 90 degree angle. It rotates on its side like that. Um, here you can see it has storms in the atmosphere like, like, uh, like any of the gas giants. So the moons of Uranus, it has dozens of moons. Um, you can see here, these are named, this is kind of interesting, these are named for characters from Shakespearean plays. Oberon, Titania, you know, you can read these. Um, yeah, that's really all that I want to say about, about Uranus. So let's move on to Neptune. So Neptune, the last of the four gas giants, um, is a, little, a, a bit of a, a darker blue. It's also blue because of methane. You can see it has storms. In terms of the size comparison, here's Earth compared to, to Neptune. Um, it has the great dark spot, which is uh, a, a hurricane-like storm similar to the great red spot on, on Jupiter. Um, Neptune has lots of moons. The only one that I really want you to know is um, Triton. You know, Neptune is the name for, is the Roman name for, 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 for Poseidon. Um, so, you know, if you, people always get Titan and Titania and Triton confused. So, you know, Neptune's Poseidon, the Little Mermaid, what's your father's name? King Triton with the trident, so that you can you can remember that the Triton is the mood of Neptune by thinking about the, the 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 Little Mermaid. Okay, so actually we're going to stop there because the next thing we're going to discuss is Pluto, 
which, you know, our last video is on other objects in the solar system, which include dwarf planets. So we're going to end this one here and hope that was helpful. And I will see you guys next time.